Hi, um, welcome to Radical Reads. I just want to say really quick that I apologize that sound is only going to be coming from what seems like the left, maybe. Uh, there's no real feasible way for me to fix this in a timely manner, and I'm running out of time to read this. So, yeah, hopefully I can fix that in post later. Um, we're going to be reading We Do This Till We Free Us by Mriam Kaba, an abolitionist organizing and transforming justice. Um, let's see. Starting with part one. So you're thinking about becoming an abolitionist. So you're thinking about becoming an abolitionist. Level October 2020. Today, more people are discussing and contemplating prison abolition than ever before. Decades of collective organizing have brought us to the moment. Some are newly aware that prisons, policing, and the criminal punishment systems in general are racist, oppressive, and ineffective. However, some might be wondering, is abolition too drastic? Can we really get rid of prisons and policing altogether? The short answer, we can, we must, we are. The prison industrial complex abolition is a political vision, a structural analysis of oppression, and a practical organizing strategy. While some people might think of abolition as primarily a negative project, let's tear everything down tomorrow and hope for the best, PIC abolition is a vision of a uh, PIC abolition is a vision of a re restructured society in a world where we have everything we need. Food, shelter, education, health, art, beauty, clean water, and more things that are foundational to our personal and community safety. Every vision is also a map. As freedom fighter Kwam Ture taught us, when you see it, people call themselves revolutionary, always talking about destroying, 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 but never talking about building or creating, they're not revolutionary. They do not understand the first thing about revolution. It's creating. PIC abolition is a positive project that focuses in part on building a society where it is possible to address harm without relying on structural forms of oppression or the violent systems that increase it. Some people may ask, does this mean that I can never call the cops if my life is in serious danger? Abolition does not center that question. Instead, abolition challenges us to ask, why do we have no other well-resourced options, and pushes us to creatively consider how we can grow, build, and try other avenues to reduce harm. Repeated attempts to approve the sole option offered by the state, despite how consistently corrupt and injurious, injurious it has proven itself, will neither reduce nor address the harm that actually required the call. Oh my gosh. Uh. We need more and effective options for the greatest number of people. Let's begin our abolitionist journey not with the question, what do we have now and how can we make it better? Instead, let's ask, what can we imagine for ourselves and the world? If we do that, then boundless op possibilities of a more just world awaits us. An abolitionist journey ignites other questions capable of meaningful and transformative pathways. What work do pr prisons and policing actually do? Most people assume that incarceration helps to reduce violence and crime, thinking that the criminal punishment system might be a racist, sexist, classist, ableist, and unfair, but it at least keeps me safe from violence and crime. Facts and history tell a different story. Increasing rates of incarceration have a minimal impact on crime rates. Research and common sense suggest that economic precarity is correlated with cri higher crime rates, and moreover, crime and harm are not synonymous, synonymous. All that is criminalized isn't harmful, and all harm isn't necessarily criminalized. For example, wage theft by employers isn't generally criminalized, but is definitely harmful. Even if the criminal punishment system were free of racism, classism, sexism, and other isms, it would not be capable of effectively addressing harm. For example, if we want to reduce or end sexual and gender violence, putting a few perpetrators in prison does little to stop the many other perpetrators. It does nothing to change a culture that makes this harm, harm imaginable. To hold the Im individual perpetrator accountable to support their transformation or to meet the ne needs of the survivors. A transformative justice movement led by black, indigenous, and people of color survivors has emerged in the past two decades to offer a different vision for ending violence and transforming our communities. 
A world without harm isn't possible and isn't what an, an abolitionist vision purports to achieve. Rather, abolitionist politics and practice, con practice contend that disposing of people by locking them away in jails and prisons does nothing significant to prevent, reduce, or transform harm in the aggregate. It rarely, if ever, encourages people to take accountability for their actions. Instead, our adversary adversarial court system discourages people from ever acknowledging let alone taking responsibility for the harm they have caused at the same time it allows us to avoid our own responsibilities to hold on hold each other accountable instead delegating it to a third party one that has been built to hide in a way social and political failures an abolitionist imagination takes up take us an abolitionist imagination takes us along a different path than if we try to simply replace the PIC with similar structures. None of us have, none of us has all the answers, or we would we would have ended oppression already. But if we keep building the world we want, trying new things and learning from our mistakes, new possibilities emerge. Here's how to begin. First. When we, think, when we set about trying to transform society, we must remember that we ourselves will also need to transform. Our imagination of what a different world can be is limited. We are deeply entangled in the very systems. We are organizing to change. We are deeply entangled in the very systems we are organizing to change. White supremacy, misogyny, ableism, classism, homophobia, and transphobia exist everywhere. We have all so thoroughly internalized these logics of oppression that if oppression were to end tomorrow, we would likely, we would be likely to reproduce previous structures. Being intentionally, uh, in being intentionally in relation to one another, a part of a collective, helps to not only imagine new worlds but also to imagine ourselves differently. Join some of the many organizations, faith groups and ad hoc collectives that are working to learn and unlearn, for example, what it feels like to actually be safe or those that are naming and challenging white supremacy and racial capitalism. Second, we must imagine an experiment with new collective structures that enable us to take a more principled action, such as embracing collective responsibility to resolve conflicts. We can learn lessons from re revolutionary moments like Brazil's landless workers' movement, movement movimento dos Trabajadores Rurá, oh no, Rurés Sam Tara, Terra, that have noted that when we create a social structure that are less hierarchical and more transparent, we reduce violence and harms. Third, we must simultaneously engage in strategies that reduce contact between people and the criminal legal systems. Abolitionists regularly engage in organizing campaigns and mutual aid efforts that move us closer to our goals. We must remember that the goal is not to create a, gent a gentler prison or and policing system because, as I have noted, a gentler prison and policing system cannot adequately address harm. Instead, we want to divest from these systems as we create the world in which we want to live. Fourth, as scholar and activist Ruth Wilson Gilmore notes, building a different world requires that we not only change how we address harm, but also that we change everything. The prison industrial complex is linked in its logics and operations with all other systems from how students are pushed out of schools when they don't perform as expected to how people with disabilities are excluded from our communities and the ways in which workers are treated as expendable in our capitalist system. Changing everything might sound daunting, but it also means that there are many places to start, infinite opportunities to collaborate, and endless imaginative interventions and experiments to create. Let's begin our abolitionist journey not with the question, what do we have now and how can we make it better? Instead, let's ask, what can we imagine for ourselves in the world? If we do that, then, we, then boundless op possibilities of a more just world await us. The system isn't broken. The New Inquiry, June 2015. Miss K, they got me again. Six words set up a familiar routine. A car ride to the station, an unwanted and unwelcomed conversation with the officer at the desk, rudeness, contempt, and the awful perma smirk. <laughs> Waiting in anticipation, false alarms, a reprieve, an escape without ransom, more waiting. 
Finally, the bowed head and slumped shoulders of a young black man walking towards me. No tears. Where are the tears? Another court date, or maybe not, another record to expunge, always. Then it starts all over again. I dread summer. It's the season of hyper-surveillance and even more aggressive policing of young people of color in my neighborhood. The urban summer, criminalization merry-go-round, a kind of demented child's play. Quotation, terrorism in the service of law and order, low-intensity police riots against young black people. My antidotal observations are supported by empirical data. The ACLU of Illinois says that last summer, based on the population, Chicago police made far more street stops than New York City police did at the height of their stop and frisk. The CPD, Chicago Police Department, stopped more than 250,000 innocent people. Unsurprisingly, the vast majority of those stops involved black people who, while making up 32% of Chicago's population, were 72% of the stops. Some su- studies suggest a correlation between summer and a rise in crime. I can hear the justifications. If crime increases in the summer, then more police aggression is justified. This fails to take into account the routine interactions between police and young people in my community are fraught all year long. Summer exaber- exacerbates those oppressive contacts because many, many more young people are out of school and usually without jobs hanging out in public spaces. Public spaces in urban and suburban towns are, const- are contested. Residents collude with law enforcement to police and enforce boundaries. Young people of color are criminalized not only by the police, but also by community members. Yesterday, yet another video went viral on social media. It depicts police officers in McKinney, Texas, swimming at a pool party filled with teenagers and one particular officer manhandling a 14-year-old black girl wearing a bikini. The young people are cursed at, have a gun pointed at them, and then taunted for being afraid of the cops. 15 years 15-year-old Miles J. Thomas explains what happened. So, a cop grabbed her arm and flipped her to the ground after she and him were arguing about him cursing at us, Thomas said. When two teens went toward the cop to help the girl, they were accused of sneaking up on, on the cop to attack. So, a cop yelled, get those motherfuckers, and they chased us with guns out. That's why in this video I started running, Thomas said. I was scared because all I could think was... (sighs) <sighs> don't shoot me he said watching the video i was stuck i was struck by how the young people were denied the right to be afraid their fear was illegitimate and it makes sense only human beings are allowed to be afraid for the cops these youth of color mostly black are not human i dread summer <sighs> i attended a conference recently about youth police interactions The familiar trope about the need for young people and the cops to get to know each other was band-aid about. Useless problem offered up as a solution for ending police violence, which relies on a faulty definition of the problem. As a young person once told me, I know the cops here very well, and they know me. We know each other too well. That's not the problem. The problem is that they harass me daily. If they'd stop that, we'd be fine. The young people in my community who came come into contact with the police can recite their names and badge numbers. Those are unforgettable to them. The stuff of their nightmares. It's unclear to me how It's unclear to me how more conversations will change the dynamic of such oppression. For most of the public, whether liberal or conservative, it's the cops' job to arrest people and they are incentivized to do that work. Presumably then, What would need to change to shift the dynamics are the job descriptions and the incentives. A a persistent and seemingly endemic feature of the U.S. society in the conflation of blackness and criminality. William Patterson, a well-known black communist, wrote in 1970, A false brand of criminality is constantly stamped on the the brow of black youth by the courts and systematically kept there creating the fiction that blacks are criminally minded people. He added that the lies against blacks are propped up ideologically. I would suggest that they are also maintained and enforced through force and violence. When Baltimore police dressed in riot gear turned their violence on high school students at the Mondawmin Mall a few weeks ago, some people were horrified. 
These are children, onlookers exclaimed on social media. I thought grimly of how cops would see the situation. There are no children here, only targets and threats. Social science research research suggests that the cops see black children as older and as less innocent than their white peers. The research confirms that what mostly most of us already know, black children are considered to be disposable and dangerous many adults. This is not new. I came across the story of a 13-year-old Beverly Lee when I read the 1951 We Charge Genocide petition many years ago. Lee was shot in the back by a Detroit police officer on October 12, 1947. Here's the item that picked my interest as it appeared in We Charge Genocide. Beverly Lee, 13-year-old youth, was shot to death by policeman Louis Began of Detroit, Michigan. Miss Frances Von Botten of 1839 Pine testified that she saw Lee and another walking down the street and saw the squad car approach. She heard, stop you, little so-and-so, and and then a shot. The officer was subsequently cleared by Connor Lloyd K. Bobcock. I was particularly interested in the incident because I thought that Beverly was a girl and police violence cases involving black girls and young women have been overlooked. In fact, I haven't found any historical incidents of police violence against black women and girls that led a mass mobilization. Current campaigns such as Say Her Name point to the enduring erasure of state violence against black girls and women. The The incident in McKinney, Texas featured physical violence against black girl, underscoring the fact that girls, cis and trans, are consistently at risk of law enforcement abuse. On further research, I learned that Beverly Lee was actually a boy on the day that after Beverly Lee was shot, the Detroit News reported on the incident. Shot in the back as he tried to evade arrest, a 7th grade schoolboy was killed by a Detroit patrol men late Sunday. The boy, Be- Beverly Lee, 13, of 2637 12th Street, was shot by a tr- patrolman, Louis Began, of the Trumbull Station when he disregarded orders to halt. Begin and his part- Began and his partner, patrolman William Owens, were called to Temple and Vermont Avenues where Miss Mabel G, 1930 Temple, reported her pursuit- purse stolen. Approaching the intersection, they saw Lee, ordered him to halt, and Owens fired a warning shot. Begin, Began shot him as he continued to run away from the scout car. A watch belonging to Miss G and $18, the amount she said was in her purse, were found in the boy's pockets. The purse was recovered nearby. Began and Owens made a statement to William D. Rustar, assistant prosecutor. They said Miss G referred to her assault assailant as a man, and when they encountered him... They thought he was an adult, emphasis mine. Lee was about five feet, six inches tall. Other victims of recent purse snatchings were being invited to view the body at the county morgue. Lee attended Condom Intermediate School. His body was identified by his mother, Miss Leah Lee. The discrepancy between those two accounts is unsurprising, as we often see, or As we have so often seen, there is usually a variance between initial press reports and official police accounts and community narratives. Notice that the cops and the alleged robbery victims said that they thought Lee was an adult. The adultification of black children has long and deep roots in the black in the date black. The adultification of black children has long and deep roots that date back to chattel slavery. In fact, before the Civil War, half of all enslaved people were under 16 years old. Enslaved children were property and were expected to work. Children as young as six years old worked in the fields. Beverly Lee was the third black boy killed by the police that year in Detroit. Community members were furious and organized protests over Lee's killing. Despite the uproar, only eight days after the shooting, the the prosecutor closed the investigation into Lee's death, calling it justified, justifiable homicide. The Detroit NAACP met with the prosecutor and called for an inquest into the facts of the case. They presented him, uh, they presented him with signed statements of witness contradicting his findings. It appears that the community led by the NAACP continued to organize around Lee's case without success. Charges were not brought against Officer Began. Police 
um, impunity ha- police impunity has a long history in this country. In the end, a 13-year-old black boy was shot in the back by police and died. To quote Ossie Davis, black people understand that we live in we live with death and it is ours. Most often, it's police shootings and killings that spark urban uprising. However, the daily indignities and more invisible harms are ever present and are the foundation of hostilities between young people of color and the police. Routine state violence carried out by the police happens outside of public view under the guise of addressing gun and other forms of violence. If past is prologue, my community can look forward to another summer of intense, relentless, and surely illegal police harassment of young police people of color, and specifically of young black men. Young people riding their bikes on the sidewalks instead of being ticketed as prescribed by law will be hauled into police lockups. They'll be accused of resisting arrest and then funneled into the Cook County Jail. Teenagers leaving summer programming will be followed by cop cars and asked where they're heading. One crossword will lead to being roughly thrown on car hoods in front of the whole neighborhood. Walking through alleys as shortcuts to head home from work, young people will be hounded, provoked, and dragged into station, but not before being beaten in the car without any concern for health conditions like seizures. Trans and gender nonconforming youth will be bullied and verbally harassed by walking down the street. Young people will be picked up without cause and driven into rival gang territory to be dumped without wallets or phones, only to hear the cops announce for all to hear that they belong to the rival gang. Young women walking down the street minding their own business will be sexually harassed by those sworn to protect and serve. I dread summer. Besides stops and frisks and other violations, young people in my community are also subjected to warrantlessly, warrantless searches of their homes. One young person I know narrated his experience in 2014, We Charge Genocide Report, to the United Nations Committee Against Torture. We're sitting in a house playing video games and we hear a banging at the door. Before we know it, the door is kicked in and there's five special ops officers with their huge M16s drawn pointed at us three 15-year-olds playing video games, and they tell us to get on the ground. They say if we move, they're going to kill us. Don't look at me. We're, gu- we're fucking kill- we'll-, we'll fucking kill you in a second, pointing their guns at us, and then they don't find anything. They let us go, and they laugh, try to joke, joke with us, apologize, then leave out, and we're sitting there like, what just happened? They tear up the house. They stole money. Lest you think that this is an innovation of zero-tolerance militarized policing born out of the war on drugs, here's an example from 80 years ago. When the police of Harlem rioted in 1935, it was once again an incident of police violence that lit the fuse. A rumor that Lena v- Rivera, uh, Lino Rivera, a 16-year-old black Puerto Rican young man, was killed by New York police, led to another 4,000 Harlemites taking to the streets. 700 police officers were dispatched to the community. When all was said and done, three people had died and more than $200 million in damages were sustained from the riot. In the aftermath, Mayor LaGuardia LaGuardia commissioned a report to understand the cause of the uprising. In a section titled The Police in Harlem, The report's authors maintained that the cops routinely entered the homes of black Harlemettes without a warrant and searched them at will. Instead of drugs, Harlem cops in the 1930s were searching for policy slips and efforts to crack down on illegal gambling. Reprinted in the report was a letter by a Harlem resident addressed to the mayor. Below are a few excerpts. On Tuesday morning, April 16, 1935, between 10 and 11 o'clock, the superintendent of the house wrapped at my door upon opening it i was confronted confronted with three men men in civil civilian civilian clothes who the superintendent said were policemen he explained that the men were searching the house for what he did not know the men entered the room and proceeded to search without showing shields or search warrant i asked twice to twice of the two of the men what was the reason for such action i received no answer from any of them my dresser drawers were ru- thoroughly gone into, dresser cover even being raised. My bed came fr- in from a similar search. Covers were dragged off and the mattress overturned. 
Suitcase under my bed was brought up and searched. My overcoat hanging at the door was gone over and into. My china closet was opened and glassware examined. After this startling act, the men left my room, still without saying a word. These types of violations span centuries for black people and are one of the reasons for racial disconnects in the discussion about privacy and civil liberties. Black people have always been under the gaze of the state, and we know that our rights are routinely vi- vi- uh, violable. Civil liberties and individual rights have, been, have different meanings for different groups of people. They also have different priorities. Depending on social context, a review of black history suggests that consideration of civil liberties are always embedded within concepts of equality and social justice. In other words, by design or necessity, black people have focused on our collective rights over the individual liberties. This makes sense in a society where we don't, we don't just assume individual black guilt and suspicion. We are all guilty and we're all in suspicion, even if we may want to deny this reality. In that context, individual liberties and rights take a backseat to a collective struggle for emancipation and freedom. Additionally, as people, we have always known that it has been possible for us to exercise our individual rights within a context of more generalized social, economic, and political oppression. History offers an evidence of the inter- intractability of the problem of police violence. What should we do then? Quite simply, we must end the police. The hegemony of police is so complete that we can't even begin to imagine a world without, without the institution. We are too reliant on the police. In fact, the police increase their legitimacy through all the non-police-related work that they assume, including doing wellness and mental health checks. Why should armed people be deployed to do the work of community members and social workers? Why have we been so so comfortable with ceding so much power to the police? Any discussion of reform must begin with the following questions. How will we decrease the number of police and how will we defund the institution? On the way to abolition, we can take a number of intermediate steps to shrink the police force and to restructure our relationships with each other. Those include organizing for dramatic decreases of police budgets and redirecting those funds to social goods, ending cash bail, overturning police bills of rights, abolishing police unions, crowdfunding out the police in our communities, disarming the police, creating abolitionist messages to penetrate the public consciousness to disrupt the idea that cops equal safety, building community-based interventions that address harms without relying on police, evaluating any reforms based on the criteria, thinking through the end of policing, and imagining alternatives. Importantly, we must reject all talk about policing and the overall criminal punishment system being broken or not working, by rhetorically constructing the criminal by rhetorically constructing the criminal punishment system as broken reform is reaffirmed and abolition is painted as unrealistic and unworkable those of us who maintain that reform is actually impossible within the current context are positioned as unreasonable and naive ideological formations often operate invisible to uh invisibly to de- to lineate and define what is acceptable discourse. Challenges to dominate ideological formations about justice are met with anger, ridicule, or simply ignored. This is, n- this is in the service of those who benefit from the current system and works to enforce white supremacy and anti-blackness. The losers under the injustice system are the young people I know and love. I really dread summer. <sighs> Yes, we mean literally abolish the police. The New York Times, June 2020. (sighs) Congressional Democrats want to make it easier to identify and prosecute police misconduct. Joe Biden wants to give police departments $300 million dollars. But efforts to solve police violence through liberal reforms like these have failed for nearly a century. Enough. We can't reform the police. The only way to diminish police violence is to reduce contact between the public and police. There's not a single era in the United States history in which the police were not a force of violence against black people. Policing in the South emerged from the slave patrols in the 1700s and 1800s that caught and returned runaway slaves. In the North, 
the first municipal police department in the mid-1800s, helped quash labor strikes and riots against the rich. Everywhere, police have suppressed marginalized populations to protect the status quo. So when you see a police officer pressing his knee into the black man's neck until he dies, that's the logical result of policing in America. When a police officer brutalizes a black person, he is doing what he sees as his job. Now, now two weeks of nationwide protest have led some to call for defunding the police, while others argued that doing so would make us less safe. The first thing to point out is that police officers don't do what you think they do. They spend most of their time responding to noise complaints, issuing parking and traffic citations, and dealing with other non-criminal issues. We've been taught to think that they catch the bad guys, they chase the bank robbers, they find the serial killers, said Alex Vital, the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College in an interview with Jacobin. But this is a big myth, he said. The vast majority of police officers make one felony arrest a year. If they make two, they're cop of a cop of the month. We can't simply charge their job descriptions to focus the worst on the uh, to focus on the worst of the worst criminals. That's not what they're set up to do. Second, a safe world is not one which the police keep black and other marginalized people in check through threats or arrest, incarceration, violence, and death. I've been advocating for abolition of the police for years. Regardless of your view on police power, whether you want to get rid of the police or simply to make them less violent, here's an immediate demand we have to we can all make. Cut the number of police in half, cut their budget in half. The fewer police officers equals fewer opportunities for them to brutalize and kill people. The idea is gaining traction in Minneapolis, Del- Dallas, Los Angeles, and other cities. History is instructive, not because it offers a blueprint for us to act in the present, but because it can help us ask better questions for the future. The Lexow Committee undertook the first major investigation into police misconduct in New York City in, 19, in 1894. At the time, the most common complaint against the police was about clubbing, the routine bludgeoning of citizens by patrolmen armed with nightsticks or blackjacks. As the historian Marilyn Johnson has written, the, the Wicks- Wickersham Commission conven- uh convened to study the criminal justice system and examine the problem of prohibition enforcement, offering a scathing indication in 1931, including evidence of brutal brutal interrogation strategies. I put the blame on the lack of professionalism among the police. After the 1967 urban uprising, the Kerner Commission found that the police actions were final incidents before the outbreak of violence in 12 of the 24 surveying disorders. Its reported list listed a now familiar set of recommendations like working to build community support for law enforcement and reviewing police operations in the ghetto to ensure proper conduct by the police officers. These commissions didn't stop the violence. They just served as a kind of counterinsurgent function each time police violence led to protest. Calls for similar reforms were trotted out in the response to the brutal police beatings of Rodney King in 1991 and the rebellion that followed, and again after the killings of Michael Brown and Eric Garner. The Obama administration's final report on the president's task force on 21st century policing resulted in procedural tweaks like implicit bias training, police community listening sessions, slight alterations of use of force policies, and systems to identify potentially problematic officers earlier on. But even a member of the task force, Tracy Mears, noted in 2017, policing as we know it must be abolished before it can be transformed. The philosophy under guiding these reforms is more that is that more rules means less violence. But police officers break rules all the time. Look what happened over the past few weeks police officers slashing tires, shoving old men on camera, and arresting and injuring journalists and protesters. These officers are not worried about the repercussions any more than Daniel Pentaleo, the former New York City police officer whose chokehold led to Eric Gardner's death. He waved to a camera filming the incident. He knew that the police union would back him up, and he was right. He stayed on his job for another five, five more years. Minneapolis has instituted many of these best practices, but failed to remove Derek Chauvin from the force despite 17 misconduct complaints over nearly two decades. 
culminating in the entire world watching as he knelt on George Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes, why on earth would we think that the same reforms would work now? We need to change our demands. The surest way to reduce police violence is to reduce the power of the police by cutting budgets and the number of officers. But don't get me wrong. We're not abandoning our communities to violence. We don't want to just close police departments. We want to make them obsolete. We should redirect the billions that now go to police departments towards providing health care, housing, education, and good jobs. If we did this, there'd be less need for the police in the first place. We can build other ways to, of responding to harms in our society. Trained community care workers could do mental health check-ins if someone helps, needs help. Towns could use restorative justice models instead of throwing people in prison. What about rape? The current approach hasn't ended it. In fact, most rapists never see the inside of courtroom. Two-thirds of people who in experience sexual violence never report it to anyone. Those who file police reports are often dissatisfied with the response, and additionally, police officers themselves commit sexual assaults alarmingly often. A study in 2010 found that sexual misconduct was the second most frequently reported form of police misconduct. In 2015, the Buffalo News found that an officer was caught for sexual misconduct every five days. When people, especially white people, consider a world without the police, they envision a society as violent as our current one, merely without law enforcement, and they shudder. As a society, we have been so indoctrinated by the idea that we solve problems by policing and caging people that we cannot imagine anything other than prisons and the police as solutions to violence and harm. People like me, who want to abolish prisons and police, however, have a vision of a different society— built on cooperation instead of individualism, on mutual aid instead of self-preservation, what, what would the country look like if it had a billion ex of extra dollars to spend on housing, food, and education for all? This change in society wouldn't happen immediately, but the protests show that many people are ready to embrace a different version of safety and justice. When the streets calm and people suggest once more, once again, that we hire more black police officers or create more civilian review boards, I hope that we all remember that we remember all the times those efforts have failed. A jailbreak of the imagination, seeing prisons for what they are and demanding transformation with Kelly Hayes, Truth Out, May 2018. Our current historical moment demands a radical reimagining of how we address various harms. The levers of power are currently in the hands of the administration that is openly hostile to the most marginalized in our society, black people, native people, the poor, LGBTQ plus people, immigrant communities, and more. While we protect ourselves from their con consistent and regular blows, we must also fight for a vision of the world we want to inhabit. For us, there's a world where people like Tiffany Rusher, who began a five-year sentence at Logan Correctional Center in Broadwell, Township, Illinois, in 2013, are not tortured to death in the name of safety. Our visions insist on the abolition of the prison industrial complex as a critical pillar of creation of a new society. Imprisoned on charges related to sex work, Tiffany Rusher was eventually placed in solitary confinement for getting into physical struggle with one of her cellmates. During her time in the solitary confinement, Rusher's mental health began to deteriorate initiating a cycle of self-harm. After a series of suicide attempts and periods of solitary confinement, Rushers was placed on a crisis watch for a period of eight, eight months. According to Rushers' lawyer, Alan Mills, being on crisis watch meant being stripped of all clothing and belongings and placed in a bare cell with only suicide smock, a single piece of thick woven nylon, too stiff to fold, with holes for one, one's head and arms. During this time, Rusher was monitored through a pexiglass wall with the lights on 24 hours a day rather than receiving mental health care. Rusher was kept naked except for her rigid smock in an empty cell. She was given strict dehumanizing instructions about how to wipe herself and manage her menstrual hygiene, which, was in, which, included, an, uh, which included a requirement that her hands be visible to the guard watching her at all times. In order to read... Rusher had to persuade a prison guard to hold, open, hold an open book against the glass of her cell and turn each page as she finished reading it. As time wore on, Rusher asked her attorney who in her situation wouldn't want to kill her themselves. At the end of her sentence, Rusher was finally transferred to a mental health facility. 
Rusher, who disclosed to her doctors that she had experienced childhood sexual abuse, had received dozens of diagnoses over the years, including schizophrenic, schizoaffective disorder, but nonetheless made great strides while in treatment. Eight months into her inpatient care, however, Rusher got into altercation with another patient. Rather than treating the episode as a symptom of her mental health problems, she was sent back to jail, where the cycle of carceral violence continued. After Rusher's death, her mother, Kelly Andrews, at, said in a statement, Tiffany was a beautiful soul with hopes. <sighs> Tiffany was a beautiful soul with hopes for her future. She was looking forward to coming home to be with her family. We miss her every day. Sagamon County Jail returned Rusher to solitary confinement where she remained for three months before being found unresponsive with a ripped piece of towel around her neck. Rusher died 12 days later with the... Rusher died 12 days later when the hospital removed her from life support. In the words of Mills, first they tortured her, first they tortured her, then they killed her. At the time of her death, Tiffany Rusher was a 20, 27-year-old was 27 years old. Sadly, what Rusher d endured was not exceptional. The U.S. prison system is designated to crush people like Tiffany Rusher every day, with only a small section of society laboring to help prisoners save themselves from being grounded under. In Rusher's case, the, eternity, the attorneys and staff of Uptown People's Law Center in Chicago were her defenders, but in the end, the, the wounds inflicted by the system were too deep, and the cycle of carceral violence was simply too entrenched to interrupt. Rusher now, a statistic to the world at large and a court filing to those who attorneys have, would hold accountable for her death, was refused any recognition of her humanity of her humanity while incarcerated. But Rusher was not a number. She was a human being and restored and restoring our awareness of the humanity of prisoners and the cru is a crucial step toward undoing the harms of mass incarceration. As prison and abolitionists, grassroots organizers, and practitioners of transformative justice, our vision for 2018 is one of clear-eyed awareness and discussion of the horrors of the prison system and the action that awareness demands. As a society, we have long turned away from any social concern that overwhelms us. Whether it's war, climate change, or the prison industrial complex, Americans have been conditioned to simply look away from profound harms. Years of this practice have now left us with endless wars, dying oceans, and millions of people in bondage and oppressive police, oppressively policed. It is time for a thorough, unflinched examination of what our society has wrought and what we have become. It is time to envision and create alternatives to the hellish conditions our society has brought into being. The illusion of the illusion of a new idea. Outspoken opponents of ab uh, of abolishing the prison and industrial complex typically portrays abolitionists as po politically inactive academics who spout imposable impossible ideas. None of this could be further from the truth. Abolitionists come from all backgrounds and most are politically active. From bail reform to strategic electoral interventions and mutual aid, prison abolitionists are steadily at work in our communities, employing tactics of harm reduction, lobbying for and against legislation, defending the rights of prisoners in, solitary, in solidarity with those organizing for themselves on the inside and working to forward a vision of, so of social transformation. As, political, as a political framework, abolition has gained significant ground in recent years with groups like the National Lawyers Guild adopting the phil philosophy of their work. A growing number of grassroots abolitionist organizers have co-organized nationally recognized, nationally recognized campaigns such as the Buy, An Buy Anita effort in Chicago, which helped to successfully remove former state's attorney Anita Alvarez from office. Abolitionist organizing, or organizers have also helped lead efforts to win reparations for survivors of torture that occurred under the now infamous police commander John Burge in Chicago, a city that has, over the past two decades, became a hub of abolitionist organizing. 
Abolition is a practi- practical organizing strategy. Like any enterprise there was that was born out of uh like any enterprise that was born of manufactured demands, prison perpetuates its themselves and that that requires the maintenance of conditions that foster crime. From 1978 to 2014, the US prison population rose 408%, largely filing its ca- filling its cages with those denied access to education, employment, and human services. About 70% of the prisoners in California are former foster care youth, and given to this and given that the system is actually geared towards uh recidivism there can be no argument that the prison system supports either public safety or the public good our failure to build a culture of care that nurtures human growth and potential rather than incubating desperation ensures that more criminals will be created and subsequently punished so those to the great benefit of those who profit from industries associated with incarceration Prison is simply a bad and ineffective way to address violence and crime. Yet, when we speak about abolition of the prison industrial complex, many react as though the idea is alien and unthinkable, as if, to them, prisons, policing, and surveillance are part of a natural order that simply cannot be undone. In truth, the prison system did not see its most massive population surge until the 1980s, when deindustrialization created the need for dungeon economies to replace lost jobs and a backlash against the civil rights movement and other social gains by black people propelled heightened efforts at social control. As a society, we have been taught to embrace social control, which is often enforced by people with guns because we have been taught to fear each other and to uh, acquiesce to authority. We live in a culture that celebrates criminalization, cops, and prisons, abusive, torturous police abusive torturous police become sympathetic television characters whose harms the public can understand or even sympathize with but when a civilian has a committed has committed an egregious harm the national sol- solace we are taught to seek t- is to them to see them suffer they must be thrown in a cage and once in th- they are justice is considered to be done and we all move on with our lives without ever asking the questions like why did this happen? Why did does it keep happening? And is there something we could change that would make this tra- uh, tragedy unthinkable in the first place? Clapping for incarceration. Even those who acknowledge the mass incarceration in the U.S. is a nightmarish and unjust often feel compelled to applaud when the system ensnares someone whose harms disgust us. When Martin Scrawley, a former hedge fund manager, was sentenced to serve or s- serve seven years for securities fraud memes and laughter abound screlly who famously engaged in the pharmaceutical price gouging raising the price of the drug daraprim from thirteen dollars and fifty cents to seven hundred and fifty dollars per pill was once characterized as the most hated man in america making him an ideal poster child for the carceral state but like most ideas that allow us to avert our eyes and ignore the larger systems this notion is full of holes for one Screlly was not being punished for forcing AIDS patients to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in life-saving medications because rich people simply are not punished for practicing capitalism in the United States. As long as their money-changing kills according to the rules of the free market, they see no penalty. Screlly was punished for security frauds. In short, he played Monopoly with the filthy rich and broke the rules. Yet because he also harmed everyday people, this moment is held up as one where the system worked because someone we felt contempt for was punished. The system will occasionally offer such kernels, but they don't add up to justice. No reform is being forced upon the pharmaceutical industry in the wake of Screlly's harms, and the executives who are driving up prices on insulin and other life-saving medications are not faced with jail time if this is our marker of justice. Our society's practice of justice is not concerned with creating just conditions, and our system of punishment does not penalize the powerful for crushing those with less power. The rich getting richer while others on the ground under the part of the just order of society. Oh, I'm sorry. The rich getting richer while others are ground under is part of the just order of society. There are no solutions offered by the system, only the occasional display of suffering or civil death to satisfy the masses. 
Given these conditions, we must understand that by applauding carceral violence, we are also applauding an established and grotesque failure on the part of Western civilization. Study Stories like Tiffany Rusher's are buried under headlines about people like Screlly and serial rapist Larry Nassar. Stories that reassure the public that retribution is necessary and sate, and that sate a popular desire for vengeance in the face of tragedy and harm. American crime stories are not stories of good versus evil because the system is not and has never been good or heroic, and criminal harms are usually much more complex than we would care to acknowledge. The crimes of, for which Tiffany Rusher was convicted involved, a sex with a, involved sex with a minor, but why was Rusher in the sexual proxi- proximity to a minor in the first place? Prison is simply a bad and ineffective way to address violence and crime. Cases like Rusher's call on us both to acknowledge the harms of our systems has inflicted and to create a kind of social and economic conditions in which a young woman would never be presented with the choices that Rusher's faced. According to Rusher, she was doing survival sex work when she, uh, she was solicited to provide sexual services at a party. As it turns out, the young man, a relative, uh, the young man, a relative wanted to purchase sexual favors for was underage. Rusher was 21 years old when the young man's mother learned about the party. She was in, uh, incest and filled. She was in, incest and filed a police report, and just like that, Rusher became a sexual offender in the eyes of the law. However, different her experiences may have been from those who typically characterized as predators. Rusher was ensnared by a damning and unyielding brand of criminalization. Dangerous people. When confronted, when confronted with the statistics about how, how unevenly criminal penalties are applied to the United States or with historical evidence that policing and incarceration have always been grounded in anti-blackness, native erasure, and pro- protection of property, most left- leftists will decry the system and agree that change is long overdue. But such, such, is, uh, excuse me, but such administration but such admissions are usually followed by an incentive or insistence that we cannot simply uproot the system because we don't have a polished, universal, universalized, fully formed solution to address the dangers some individuals often characterize as predators may pose to our communities. But the idea of predators and dangerous people is complicated by the conditions of our society, society and forces, social and economic conditions that we know generate crime and despair, communities whose needs are met are not rife with crimes of desperation, whereas struggling communities are, and people from communities that are highly criminalized by our racist system are far more likely to be thrust in the carceral system. Politicians routinely feign ignorance with regard to these dynamics presenting tough-on-crime agendas that would enhance prison sentences and widen the school-to-prison pipeline as a solution to the harm society generates. Because if politicians acknowledge the most criminalized harms are rooted in social and economic inequalities, inequities, they would be expected to address those inequities, which most refuse to do. In the United States, the political careers of elected officials are largely funded by those who directly benefit from the inequities of our society, and those funders would likely abandon their pet officials if they pursued anything resembling economic justice. The carceral system has always been sensationalized cases and specters of unthinkable harm and create new mechanisms of disposability. Those mechanisms are what feed bodies into hungry dungeon economies while we are distracted by our own fears of bad people and what they might do if they they aren't contained. Of course, a system that never addresses the why behind a harm never actually contains the harm itself. Cages can find people, not the conditions that facilitated their harms or their mentalities that perpetuate violence. Yet, for some reason, even people who are well-versed in the dynamics of a system often believe law and order moments are possible, when just for a moment, an instrument of state violence can be made good. In their essay of The University and the Under- Undercommons, writers and scholars Fred Moten and Stefano Harney underscore why abolition is important as a political framework and organizing strategy. What is, so to speak, the object of abolition? Not much the abolition of prisons, but the abolition of society that we could have, but the abolition of a society that could have prisons, that could have slavery, that could have wage 
and therefore not abolition of the elimination of anything but abolition as the founding of a new society. When we look past the sensationalism of major headlines and examine the actual dynamics of mass incarceration, it becomes increasingly impossible to justify the perspective. While, other, while some offer calls for reform, such calls ignore the reality that an institution grounded in the commodification of human beings through torture and deprivation of their liberty cannot be made good. The logic of using policing, punishing, and police and using policing, punishment, and prisons has not proven to address the system's causes of violence. It is in this climate that we argue the abolition of the prison industrial complex is the most moral political posture available to us because the deconstruction of the American system as a mass incarceration is possible and is time. What does transformation look like? Our vision for 2018 in a state unres unrestrained imagination. Oh, um. Our vision for 2018 is a state of unrestrained imagination. When dealing with oppressive systems, cynicism is a begrudged alliance extracted from people whose minds could otherwise open doors and make new demands and conjure visions of what a better world would look like. Questions like, what about the really dangerous people are not questions a prison abolitionist must answer in order to insist the prison industrial complex, mu complex must be undone. There are questions we must collectively answer even as we trouble the very notion of dangerous. The inability to offer a neatly packaged and easily digestible solution does not preclude offering critique or analysis of the ills of our current systems. We live in a society that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. We live in a society that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. It's time to look hard at how the system came to us, who profits, how it functions, and why. And it's time to imagine what it would look like to see justice done without relying on punishment and the barbarity of carceral systems. As writer and educator Erica Miner suggests, liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design. It's time for a jailbreak for the imagina of the imagination in order to make the impossible possible. Hope is discipline. This is going to be the last chapter for um, for this uh, section. I'm actually reading two weeks of material for everyone. I did not realize I was going through this so quickly. Yeah, we're only in an hour. Um, Hope is discipline. Interviewed by Kim Wilson and Brian Sonisten. So Nenstein. Beyond Prisons, January 2018. Kim Wilson. I think someone retweeted something you posted the other day, and it just really resonated with me, and it has helped me tremendously. It is something you wrote about hope being a discipline. I gotta tell you, it made my day. <laughs> if not my week, week, absolutely, because it's easy to get down on everything that's going on. Mariam Kava. Sure. Wilson, it's really easy to kind of look around and be like, oh my God, everything, set it all on fire. Let's just be done. <laughs> Especially right now, and I think that plugging in with folks and reading things and listening to things that are affirming and uplifting and do allow us, uh, and do allow you to focus on the hopeful sides of things are part of abolition. I'd like to say, I'd like you to say something about that, but I have another part of that question which is about self-care for those of us doing this work. That's something I spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about. Kaba. I always tell people, for me, hope doesn't preclude feeling sadness or frustration or anger. Or any other emotion that makes total sense. Hope is an emotion, you know? Hope is not optimism. I think that for me, understanding that is really helpful in my practice and around organizing. I believe that there's always a potential for transformation and for change. And that is in any direction, good or bad. The idea of hope being a discipline is something I heard from a nun many years ago who was talking about it in conjunction with making sure we were 
of the world and in the world. Living in the afterlife already in the present was kind of a form of escape. But it was really, really important for us to live in the world and be of the world. The hope that she was talking about was this grounded hope that was practiced every day that people actually practiced all the time. I bowed down to that. I heard that many years ago, and then I felt this sense of, oh my God, that speaks to me as a philosophy of living, and I hope that hope is a discipline and that we have to practice it every single day. Because in the world we live in, because in the world we live in, it's easy to feel a sense of hopelessness, that everything is all bad all the time, that nothing is going to ever nothing is going to change ever, that people are evil and bad at the bottom. It feels something that it's being proven in various different ways, so I really get that. I understand why people feel that way. I just choose differently. I choose to think a different way, and I choose to act a different way. I choose to trust people until they prove themselves untrustworthy. Jim Wallace, who people know as a liberal evangelical who thinks about faith a lot and talks about faith a lot, he always talks about the fact that hope is really believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change, and that to me makes total sense. I believe ultimately that we're going to win because I believe there are so many people who want justice, real justice, than there are those who are working against that. And I don't think in short-term view. I take a long view, understanding full well that I am just a tiny little part of a story that already has a huge antidote and has something that is going to come after that. I'm definitely not going to even going to be even closer around for seeing the end of it. That also puts me in the right frame of mind that my little freaking thing I'm doing is actually pretty insignificant in the world history. But if it's insignificant to one or two people, but if it's significant to one or two people, I feel good about that. If I'm making my stance in the world and that benefits my particular community of people, the people I designate as my community, and I see them benefiting benefiting from my labor, I feel good about that. That actually is enough for me. Maybe I just have a different perspective. I talk a lot about a young, about, I talk to a lot of young organizers. People reach out to me because I've been organizing for a long time. I'm always telling them, your timeline is not the timeline in which movements occur. Your timeline is incidental. Your timeline is only for yourself to mark your growth and your living, but that's a fraction of the living that's going to be done by the universe and that has already been done by the universe. When you understand that you're really, that you're really insignificant in the grand scheme of things, then it's a freedom, in my opinion, to actually be able to work on that work that's necessary as you see it and to contribute in ways as you see fit. And self-care is really tricky for me because I don't believe in the self in the way that people determine determine it here in this capitalist society that we live in. I don't think, I don't believe in self-care. I believe in collective care, collectivizing our care and thinking about how we can help each other, how we can collectivize and care of children so that we can, so that more people can feel like they can actually have their kids, but also live in a world and contribute and participate in various different ways. How do we do that? How can, How do we collectivize care so that we aren't, when we're sick and we're not feeling ourselves, we've got a crew of people who are not just our prayer warriors, but our action warriors who are thinking through with us. Like, I'm not just going to be able to cook this week and you have a whole bunch of folks who are just putting a list together for you and bringing food every day that week. And you're doing the same for your community too. I want that as the focus of how I do things and that I want that as the focus of how I do things. And that really comes from the fact that I grew up the daughter of returned migrants, African returned migrants. I don't see the world the way that people do here. I don't agree with it. I think capitalism is actually continuously alienating us from each other, but also even from ourselves and I just don't subscribe. For me, it's too much. Yeah, I'm going to do yoga, and then I'm going to do some sit-ups, and maybe I'll go dot, dot, dot. 
you don't have to go anywhere for, to care for yourself. You can just care for yourself and your community in tandem. And that can actually be a much more healthy for, that can actually be a much more healthy for you, by the way, because all of this internalized reflection is not good for people. Yes. Think about yourself, reflect on your practice. Okay. But then you need to test it in the world. You've got to be with people. That's important. And I, and I hate people. <laughs> <laughs> And I hate people, so I say that as someone who actually is really antisocial. <laughs> Kaba, and I say, <laughs> Kaba, and I say, I hate people. I don't want to socialize in that kind of way, but I do want to be social with other folks as it relates to collectivizing care. <laughs> uh that's everything for uh the first two weeks actually jeez uh <laughs> i uh i hope that i didn't go too fast uh and i know that it's weird having only my mic on one side of the f speakers i think that this is not i don't know i'd be willing to reread this again <laughs> I just needed to have an audiobook version for anyone that needed it right away. Uh, yeah, I definitely think I stumbled on words and choked up with tears a few times. I don't know. Blah. Anyways, see y'all next week. <laughs>